So I am Alessandro Morbidelli. I am a researcher at the Observatoire de la Côte d'Azur in Nice, uh, France. I study planet, planet formation, various stages of planet formation, particular emphasis on how the solar system formed. But also I'm interested in how planetary systems form in general. And so trying to understand the big diversity of planetary systems that we observe in the galaxy with the discovery of extrasolar planets that we have today. And uh, what book are you reading now? Which book am I reading? I mean, the science book? Any book. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm reading a lot of uh, review papers on a new concept for uh, planet formation, which is called pebble accretion. This is a new model that has been developed over the years in, uh, in Sweden, in Germany, in the United States, and uh, there is a lot of new results uh, there. So um, there are a number of reviews that have appeared in uh, recent review books, like Asteroid uh, 4, Protoplanet, Protostars and Planets 6, and so on. And uh, so these are... The that's what you read for bit. pleasure. I know, that's uh, to read for, for business. <laughs> and, for, and for pleasure? Oh, for pleasure, no. I like to read books about travels. So travel. I like to travel a lot. Like and, Marco Polo? Or... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've read also Marco Polo or various adventures uh, around the world, uh, mostly about um, the Arctic. Arctic. I have a particular attraction by, uh -huh. by the Arctic and Antarctica world. So you've read about so, Mawson and... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And music? What kind of music do you like? Uh, jazz. That helps. Relaxing. Okay. Exercise? What do you do for exercise? Oh, yeah. I, I do a lot because I like to, to be fit. So my ultimate goal is to do mountaineering. No, not that uh -huh. I do that it very often, but so to stay fit and train, I run. Essentially, I run quite a, quite a bit. What, five kilometers no, a day? Or? Uh, no, I typically run uh, 12 kilometers twice a week. Oh, okay. And in your talk, you mentioned the great dichotomy. Yes. Now, how do you think there's a great dichotomy? Is it it's a universal feature of planetary systems or just in our system? So clearly we have a great dichotomy in uh, the solar system. So let me explain briefly what it is. Uh, we have uh, the terrestrial planets, which are small and rocky in the inner side of the solar system and the giant planets in the outer part. And this exi existence of two classes of planets implies that within the lifetime of the disk, uh, the protoplanets, the rocky component, the solid components of the protoplanets had to be very different and we had to have a sort of mass, mass, mass embryos in the inner part of the solar system and uh, cores, giant planet cores of about 10 Earth masses in the outer part of the planetary system. This is what I call the great dichotomy because it means that in the outer part somehow we grew protoplanets that were a hundred times more massive and what we grew in the in inner part of the solar system. And despite accretion, in principle, should be easier in the inner part because the orbital periods are much shorter, and orbital period is basically the clock of any dynamical process. So this uh, dichotomy is striking. So we try to understand uh, how that can be explained, and uh, we explain it using this uh, new concept of pebble accretion. That concept is pretty new. So um, before we thought that the planet grows accreting planetesimals, but because planetesimals are already quite big, several kilometers in size, planetesimals don't move in the disk. So each planet accretes from the local reservoir of planetesimals. And this gives some prediction about how the planets grow, which time scale, the mass distribution, and it's totally wrong, it doesn't fit, doesn't explain this great dichotomy at all. In the pebble accretion paradigm, instead the planet accretes small objects, sort of pebble size, that's why it's called pebble accretion. Uh, well, con named pebble being a sort of loose, because sometimes we talk about millimeter sized particles, they're not really pebbles, but we call it pebble accretion model. So these particles are uh, small enough to be severely affected by gas drag. So they are not fixed in the disk, they are mobile, they drift, they migrate towards the star. So each growing planet actually doesn't see a local reservoir of material, it sees a flux of material passing through its orbit and of which it can capture a portion. These are icy particles? These are icy or silicate, depending on where we are in the disk. If you are in the outer disk beyond the snow line, they are mostly icy. But that's where they start out. Right? And they where they start out, yeah. So, so everything they... should start out as a mixture of ice and silicates. And then when they drift inside of the snow line, where the temperature goes about 200 Kelvin, then the ice sublimates. 
and it goes away, uh, the ice represents about 50% of the total mass in solids, so puff, 50% of the mass goes away, poof, like that. And uh, presumably, if these icy pebbles contain silicate grains, with the uh, sublimation of the ice, the silicate grains are released, and the bodies that grow inside of the snow line have to grow from just the silicate grains drifting in. And that hints at the great dichotomy, of course. So beyond the snow line, uh, the growing planets see a flux of mass, which is a factor of two higher than inside of the snow line, because there is also the ice. But also, we think that the icy pebbles are bigger than the grains that are released when the icy pebbles sublimate. And pebble accretion is more and more efficient as the pebbles are bigger and bigger. So it's much easier for a body growing beyond the snow line to create a lot of mass than for the bodies inside of the snow line. So with this, uh, we explain why in the time the cores of the giant planet grew beyond the snow line to 10 Earth masses or so, inside of the snow line, the bodies, despite they started with the same size, grew only to Mars mass. And so the great dichotomy is explained that way. Some scientists have said that uh, <laughs> Ju Jupiter has protected the Earth from impacts, while other scientists have said, well, wait a minute, Jupiter may have also produced the objects which then are I'm threatening sorry, yeah. the, the Earth. So uh, in general, is are you to say that Jupiter is both the protector and a threat? <clears throat> well, I would go a step beyond that. I think Jupiter protected us a great deal beforehand because uh, uh, if Jupiter and Saturn were not here, uh, Uranus and Neptune would have mig once formed, would have migrated towards the inner part of the solar system. We actually see that 50% of the stars have the so-called close-in super-Earths. These are planets more massive than the Earths, uh, often icy, low density, and actually sort of mini Neptunes or even Neptune mass planets. And they are located on orbits with orbital periods of 100 days or less, so inside the orbit of Venus. And uh, we think that many, most, maybe all, let's say many or most of these uh, closing super Earths, in particular the most massive and the, those with the lower, lowest density, formed further out, like Uranus and Neptune, migrated in. And in this process of migration towards uh, closing orbits, orbits, these objects would have completely destroyed the, the disk on their way, right? So preventing the formation of terrestrial planets. So why this, this did not happen here? Uh, well, Uranus and Neptune would have migrated into the inner part of the disk if Jupiter and Saturn had not been on their way. So Jupiter and Saturn did not migrate in because of uh, sort of strange dynamics that they can enact due to their, because they are giant planets, so they open gaps in the disk, and because of their mass ratio. Saturn is a third of the mass of Jupiter, and this mass ratio, is like between a quarter to half, uh, between the second planet and the first planet is a m sort of magic mass ratio that prevents inward migration of the giants. So the Jupiter and Saturn did not migrate in, they stayed where they were or possibly migrated even out because of this. And, uh, and then their presence blocked the way to Uranus and Neptune. Uranus and Neptune tend to migrate in because of their mass, but if on the way they find Jupiter and Saturn, they stay in place or move outwards, they are just caught in resonance with Saturn and stay there. So Jupiter and Saturn really block the way to Uranus and Neptune. And that's how the inner solar system remained protected by the invasion of super Earths. And that allowed you know, the survival of, of, of a system of many small mass planetary embryos about Mars mass, which then collided with each other on a time scale of 100 million years. And that's what gave origin to the system of terrestrial planets as we know it. Hmm. Well, now, a lot of scientists are looking for near-Earth objects, and the, the idea is to detect one that will hit the Earth and prevent us from being wiped out like the dinosaurs were. Let's suppose that humanity I don't know, gets into World War III and, just, and science goes <coughs> down the tubes, and you know, uh, how long would it take before something large enough to hit the Earth and then extinguish humans who are, pre, are post-scientific or something? <laughs> now, if, we don't, if we don't monitor, how long do we have? Sure. Uh, well, that's an issue. The meteor debate in the past, we thought that the Chicxulub-like uh, impact, uh, Chicxulub being the impact that killed the dinosaurs, happens every 100 million years or so. 
it probably was a lower estimate and uh, now we have a better understanding of the neo population. So it's probably of the order of three, four hundred million years, but still short relative to the age of the solar system. So these things happen. These things happen and uh, on a long time scale. I would say provocatively that this is the Darwinian selection for uh, technological intelligence. In the sense that whatever evolution drives to, uh, either uh, you form a, a civilization which is intelligent, can develop science and can develop the means to protect from this kind of uh, impacts, or af after some time span of three, four hundred million years, it's a reset and the evolution will start again. So you do that over and over and over until you form a civilization that can protect itself and survive. Or well, do you think? Uh Let's suppose that tomorrow we find, hey, there's a big thing coming. Uh, what would be the, what would you recommend? They'd call you up, NASA or the <laughs> FBI or the CIA would call you up or something and say, hey, how are you going to protect the planet? What are you going to tell them? Uh, it's difficult and it depends what is the size of the, the body that uh, headed to the Earth and how long in advance we know it. So it may be simple, for instance, if we know that this asteroid will have encounters with the Earth or with another planet before actually hitting, mm -hmm. because then we can uh, use the same technology as we use for flybys of space missions. So it's enough to deflect the orbit a little bit, and then the gravity assist with the planet will change the final orbit a lot, and then the, the collision will be missed. Or if the first encounter is the collisional encounter, then it's much harder to deviate <laughs> because then you have to deviate the body by thousands of kilometers, so you need a lot of energy. So if you need just a little bit, because then you play on the gravity assist, or you have technologies like you know the gravitational tractors, or, or you can build sails, or you can start you can build what? sails, 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 wow. or uh, you put can put a sail on the impactor. Yeah, exactly. Or uh, you can start to dig out material in order well, then for conservation of momentum. The, 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 the that probably wouldn't make as good a movie as Bruce Willis yeah, blowing yeah, them certainly, up. Yeah, certainly, certainly. But <laughs> asteroids as big as te Texas uh, don't exist on near Earth objects. Well, on near Earth how, orbits. how large? What diameter could an impactor be? and not kill life? What's the largest impactor that the Earth could have and not kill humans, for example? On a global scale, yes. I mean, yeah, that's enough, uh, probably. I think uh, five kilometers, it's enough to have a huge catastrophe, but only on a continental scale. Okay, so how big do you get, how big so can you So you get? start to have global implications above 10 kilometers, 10, 15 kilometers. These asteroids are very rare because uh, actually there is a sort of a selection effect the asteroids to escape from the asteroid belts need to move around. Yes. And if asteroids are big, they don't move around. Right, right. And so they tend not to escape. And only the small asteroids, which are more mobile, tend to escape. So we really need to be very unlucky that very big asteroids escape. It needs to be on what is called a chaotic trajectory. It slowly is modified by itself just by gravity and then eventually comes out. But most of these orbits are already depopulated. But now these objects have escaped already in the first few hundred million years of solar system history. So, so now we get only the bodies which are mobile, that those whose trajectory can be modified by collisions or by solar radiation. But Chicxulub was pretty big. Five yeah, yeah, that's uh, typically 15 kilometers, something like that. How did it get 10, out? 20 kilometers. And there are a few NEAs like Eros and Ganymede, which have this size. They don't cross the orbit of the Earth so far. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are safe. <laughs> but uh, from time to time, uh, near Earth, Earth objects. So they do ob objects whose orbit passes. Uh, within 1.3 AU from the Sun, the Earth being a 1 AU from the Sun. Okay, and um, are we alone? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it's difficult to, very di difficult to answer this question. So there is, of course, uh, the SETI program trying to capture artificial signals for space. Uh, it's been run for decades. Nothing has been found. This raises the paradox of Fermi. So if uh, we are not alone, and probably there are civilizations that are more developed than ours, our is a young civilization, we built pyramids only 4,000 years ago, and before that, nothing. So you can imagine a civilization with hundreds of thousands of years of, of, of existence. So what can they do, right? So why don't we pick up plenty of artificial signals that we do send in space, and uh, we don't get anything? So are we alone? Or does that simply mean that the next civilization is very far away or a civilization are very constrained in time? So the possibility that two civilizations exist at the same time in the galaxy and can actually communicate is, is tiny. We don't know. 
<coughs> so no detection so far. Uh, our understanding of how the solar system forms shows that it's unlikely that the planetary system is like ours. Uh, there are a few uh, crucial episodes in the formation of the solar system that really structure the solar system as it is, which are low probability events. So certainly there are billions of stars in the galaxy. So that means that it's like winning a lottery, you know, it's a very low probability to win the lottery, but if the entire nation plays, there is a winner every week. And uh, so certainly there are other, other stars that, uh, that won and have good planetary systems, more or less like ours, where life could develop. But if, uh, if it's a low probability event, it's unlikely to, that two events happen contemporary or close to each other. So when you walk in the streets, it's unlikely to meet the winner of the national lottery, of course, because this is a very rare, rare event. And so most people that you meet in the street are just normal people like you and me who never won the lottery. And uh, so I think it's, it's about the same, unless, unless there are many ways to form a habitable system. So you don't really go through the sequence of events that characterize the formation of the solar system and form the solar system as it is. You can have exotic planets. So people have thought, for instance, about ocean planets, planets full of water, more massive than the Earth. Uh, that are c covered by kilometers and kilometers of uh, oceans. Why not? You can have life on uh, satellites of giant planets in the habitable zone. So these uh, satellites, instead of being icy like Europa, would be fantastic worlds with liquid water, maybe. Uh, that really uh, will affect the likelihood of life being developed elsewhere or not. But again, SETI found nothing. But this argument about the other civilizations uh, not being contemporary or being far away. What about the idea that if you do uh, develop technology, you will then colonize the galaxy in a million years or so, and then you would have, we would have been here. We, they would be here by now. Yeah, also, I mean, uh, if... Uh, like lonely ships passing in the night. This absolutely. is a giant ship that takes over the whole ocean, and then you say, <laughs> then you're going to see them, right? So Absolutely. So, again, what are the limitations in uh, space navigation, of course? Uh, Time scale. Time scale is, is the, big, uh, the big problem. So if you want to leave uh, a star and go colonize other planets, it takes uh, thousands of years. So you have to imagine a civilization that is able to sustain itself and reproduce into this multi-generation travel uh, throughout the galaxy. Why not? For, for the Earth, it's science fiction. But again, our civilization has 4,000 years of history. And the civilization has 100,000 years of history. Who knows where it will go? Uh, but it's a fact. We have never seen anything unhuman in mm. space. Oh, so uh, that's, have you ever seen a UFO? Uh, me, no, and uh, I think nobody ever seen one. I mean, a UFO means an unidentified flying object. I can believe there are many things unidentified. I can also believe there are out there uh, many people, in particular the armies of every state, uh, who will uh, never tell you what they are flying. So probably most of these unidentified flying objects are just uh, military planes that are classified. And so I think people are in goodwill when they observe something. Some people are totally misled by Venus or Jupiter at sunset and so on. But the serious claims are probably really serious. But we will never know what the secret part of our states are doing. Right? So I don't think there is any evidence for something really non-human um, ever been spotted, and I don't think there is a conspiracy to hide that. Uh, we are looking forward uh, to find extrasolar planets, to find habitable extrasolar planets, to do spectroscopy of their atmosphere, to find signatures of life. There is a huge support all over the world, in particular in the US and in Europe, to, to, to do this kind of research. There is no plan to hide life from us. Right? Even the Vatican is open now uh, to, to, to this idea. And the Vatican Observatory officially stated that the discovery of life outside of uh, the solar system would not contradict their belief. And it's something that sooner or later will happen. And uh, so I think there is no conspiracy to try to hide from humanity the existence of our living, uh, living being. Or, uh, but simply, we have no solid evidence for that yet. Wait, wait, how does this Vatican logic work? God created man, presumably for, I don't know, put the earth there, and then if you find alien life forms, particularly if they're intelligent alien life forms, how does that fit into the Catholic dogma? 
Oh, I'm not sure if the Italian somebody <laughs> from the Vatican Observatory, but I think they consider that there is a, the universe is the creation of God, and like uh, God did not just uh, create the humans, but created plenty of living beings on Earth. We can create create plenty of living beings throughout the universe. I see, and if they are more power, if they have a better technology than we have then God gave them the upper hand for some reason? Is that the idea? <laughs> no, I think the Vatican is abandoning the idea that we are uh, the elected people and we can really? just be That's among the elected wow. people. And, uh, okay. Or brothers and sisters and uh, a few sons weeks of God, I think. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not on the Vatican Observatory. I'm not particularly religious <laughs> either, but I think that intelligent uh, uh, religious people, and there are uh, scientists who are religious and uh, saying that, you know, our colleagues at the Vatican Observatory are religious and they are clever. So they, of course, have a vision of uh, God and the creation, which is, uh, uh, which is not certainly that of a God with a beer creating the, the, the life and the, the, the man in, in a week. And it's much more evolved than that. And I think they have no problem in incorporating uh, you know, the entire universe in this view. And so respecting life holds us well. Okay, now a few weeks ago, Yuri Milner gave $100 million to support SETI searches. And there was a London launch of this. And uh, do you think that's a good idea? If you had $100 million, would you? And let's say this we have this question are we alone? Mm -hmm. If someone says, you know, Alessandro, I'm going to give you $100 million, but you have to spend it to try to answer the question are we alone? How would you spend that money? Well, I'm a modeler, so I would just keep uh, developing my institute and my group in trying to develop models that understand better and better how planets form. And my way to try to answer is to really try to understand how lucky it is that the planetary system forms and evolves in such a way to become habitable. But then, of course, there are other questions to be asked for and to be asked, and I don't have the knowledge. What, what does it take for life to emerge? What, how do you do the big jump from organic chemistry to life? It's a huge, gigantic jump, and nobody really understands how, how this happened. And if you don't understand how something happened, you cannot answer the, the, the question how likely it is to happen elsewhere. Uh, then you can say, okay, let's explore every habitable world in the solar system. And then uh, we can see if life has started everywhere the planet uh, was habitable or is habitable. So you have to explore really well uh, Mars, and then Europa, then Callisto, then Titan, and so on, because all these are potentially habitable worlds or have been habitable worlds. And that is an empirical way to answer the question. Then you can put more antennas and try to listen to the cosmos and see if you can get an artificial message from somewhere else. You can study extrasolar planets more and more, have a bigger catalog, catalog of extrasolar planets and study more in depth the planets that seem to be the most promising to host life because they are in a good location relative to their star to have a mild temperature. And all of these activities have to be done and they cost much more than $100 million. Right. Now, now, uh, <laughs> Altogether. I, we, I talked to Martin Rees, and he was pretty convinced that uh, organic life is not going to let, I mean, for example, we're going to pretty soon be evolve into inorganic life, you know, machines that go around and uh, are conscious. And uh, if you're that type of life form, you don't need a habitable zone. You're not made out of chemistry. You're made mm -hmm. out of artificial, you know, like this camera. So therefore, the habitable zone kind of changes. You, you just need, you need free energy, but you don't need like liquid, slimy sure. stuff. Um, if that's the case, then, uh, then I guess your, the, whole def the idea of looking at habitable zones around planets kind of is, becomes irrelevant. So what do you think of that? If we're looking for Yeah, it's fascinating, fascinating, of course, for this kind of life to, I mean, it's artificial life in some sense, right? So you need to have some natural life first, and then that engineers, uh, a robotic life that is capable of replicating by itself. That's, that's what we're that's, in the process of doing yeah, now, right? Yeah, that's what uh, we are trying to do. So maybe maybe it's uh, Asimov uh, trilogy was, was on that, right? And uh, uh, why not? Why not? Again, in that case, it's easy to colonize uh, stars and the galaxy because you are not limited by the lifetime of a, right. a living being. And then the Fermi paradox becomes even more paradoxical. And exactly. Exactly. So do you have a favorite solution to the paradox, the Fermi paradox, in light of inorganic life being a high probability for any advanced civilization? 
Uh, probably it's uh, not so easy to achieve that stage. And uh, again, how many civilizations reach the stage and uh, how far this kind of exploration can continue, how long it takes. And uh, so I think the solution of the Fermi paradox is that life, intelligent life, uh, is uh, very rare. So it occurs uh, statistically very f in, in places very far from each other, so very hard to communicate. I actually wonder about the sustainability of uh, sophisticated form of life. So we have a tremendous impact on uh, environment and then it's a race. Right? We'll be able to survive the damage we do to our own environment. And it's not just the damage to the environment. I mean, we need resources and we consume them and then they are done right? because the world is a finite world. So uh, will, we be, will we be able to go beyond that? So find the resources elsewhere or use different resources we have not used up to now before the lack of resources clearly impacts the civilization or not? And if not, then the civilization will end in a gigantic crisis. I don't know if it's a century from now or a millennium from now or 10,000 years from now, but something really drastically cataclysmic. And then it's the end of civilization. So what about uh, civilizations being short-lived on a time scale of you know, a few thousand, 10,000 years, let's say. Because and uh, then you have uh, sporadically at low probability, civilization popping out in the galaxy, statistically very different from each other. And in each spot, the civilization lasts a few tens of thousands of years before getting extinct. Then you have no communication possible, probably. I'm, I'm interested in the idea of are we alone and how that might change, uh, answering that question might change who we think we are. A lot of scientific revolutions have to do with changing your identity. For example, the Copernican revolution put, took man and placed him not in the center of the universe anymore. And Darwinian revolution kind of said, hey, you are an animal, you're not some, something special. So would finding alien life create some type of identity changing revolution of that sort? Yeah, yeah, sure. Because, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, we are an animal like another, but we are a special animal <laughs> we are at the top of the pyramid, the most evolved animal, the most intelligent animal, the only one who is able to do technology. So we are really, we are sort of the best animal on Earth from that point of view, even if you take, can have a different point of view, we are not the best animal in the sense that we are not the, the fastest runners. We are not those who can adapt to live at minus 30 degrees like a polar bear. So, but in terms of intelligence and capability of manipulating, we are definitely the best animal. So we have this intimate conviction that we are the best, right? And finding another civilization, maybe more advanced than ours, would be a shock. We are not the best anymore. So that, of course, will be another lesson of humility. Uh, the discovery of extrasolar planets are uh, sort of um, going backwards from the Copernican revolution. So Copernicus said, oh, the Earth is a planet like many others and uh, turned around the star like all the others. And, uh, you know, Giordano Bruno said, there are thousands of stars, there must be planets everywhere. Yeah, yeah, there are planets everywhere. But most extrasolar planetary systems are really hostile. They're really? What? Hostile. hostile. And, uh, you know, for instance, planetary orbits are very eccentric. And uh, you cannot do anything on a very eccentric planetary orbit. The climate is changing. I mean, we have seasons here. It's nothing it's just because the polar axis of the Earth is tilted. If you have an eccentric orbit, the, you know, close to the star, you get a huge radiation far from the star, very weak radiation that, you know, go from uh, glaciation to, to the extreme uh, hot weather. So it's very difficult to imagine life developing to anything uh, sophisticated in this kind, on these kind of systems. And uh, so our solar system is particularly well designed to support the Earth as it is. And as I said, we think, we understand that what are the crucial steps that form the solar system as it is. They are uh, low probability events. It's again the analogy of winning the lottery. Uh, so if you win the national lottery, you are uh, somewhat special. At least you are uh, incredibly lucky <laughs> compared to the average of the population. That's what's coming out of uh, studies of extrasolar planetary systems. 
So we are special. That we Earth. are special. So, we are extremely lucky. So you read Brown and Wardley's uh, book Rare Earth. Mm. So did you? What did you think of that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I tend to think that is right. So it's a probability argument, and uh, we. I would not expect Earths to be everywhere. Uh, there are studies, mostly by the Kepler team. Uh, tend to argue that, you know, 20% of the star or 10% of the star have an Earth in an habitable zone. But this number should be taken with a lot of caution. First, there is a huge extrapolation of, of the data because nothing has been found. Uh, and uh, then, uh, you know, they extrapolate also low signal to noise data uh, of candidate planets and uh, what candidate planets are actual planets is not that clear. And also, when, when they achieve this 10-20% uh, estimate, they tend to put together all uh, stars together. So in particular, low-mass stars. And low-mass stars, uh, we do observe planets in the so-called habitable zone. But it's unclear if these planets are habitable or not. They are so close to the star to be tidally locked to the star. Uh, so they always show the, the same face to the star, like the moon shows the same face to the Earth. So one hemisphere is very hot, the other hemisphere is very cold. And, then who knows what actually happens on, on, on these planets. Then the, the planet characteristics uh, also enter uh, into account. So it's not enough to have a planet at a good distance from the star. You need to have a good composition. Uh, no atmosphere, don't do anything. Too thick atmosphere, temperature is too high because of the greenhouse effect. Uh, you need to have some liquid water and so on. We don't know anything about the nature of these planets. Most of these planets are uh, have a low density, they probably have hydrogen atmosphere. That means there cannot be any oxygen because as soon as you produce oxygen by photosynthesis, it combines with uh, the hydrogen and forms water. So there is no free oxygen. Uh, so this, what actually is a NERF analog is uh, most likely much, much less uh, probable than 10, 20 per, these 10, 20 percent numbers for eta Earth that we hear now. Well, do you think life ha on planet Earth over the past four billion years has acted as a regulator of the surface temperature, for example? Is that has a role to play in keeping Earth habitable? Uh, it's certainly affected the chemistry of the atmosphere. For instance, the oxygen we breathe was, is, comes from life, right? And uh, before two billion years ago, the, there was no, not enough oxygen in the atmosphere. So life is changing the planet. Uh, about climate, I'm not so sure, and uh, prefer to pass <laughs> before saying something not accurate. Where men are changing the climate, that's, that's a scientific fact, but uh, about uh, bacteria and plants and so on, I think so. I think, so. I think life had an impact on, 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 the, uh, on the climate, but I'm not sure on this. So. Right. What kind of aliens would you like to find when you say, oh, <laughs> I'd like to find, I mean, obviously, obviously you don't want to find aliens that come and kill you, but yeah, what exactly. kind of aliens would you like to find? Uh, aliens who are curious and want to communicate. and Curious, want to communicate, and want to and teach you all exactly. the questions, answers oh, to your absolutely. questions. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, that would be fantastic. So yeah. omniscient aliens with a high scientific interest who would like to teach you sure, the, yeah. new, the I newbies. Would, I, would li I would not like to be in the condition of an Indian when the white people discovered America. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, <laughs> okay, but that's what you're afraid of, isn't it? I'm not afraid of, I don't think we really, that's the, the risk, I mean, we have, well, we have well, found nothing, as we said, with Seti and so on, and the Fermi paradox. So I don't think there is anybody ready to land on our Earth and colonize or slaughter us to conquer the Earth. So I think that's, that's, that risk is really infinitesimal. Well, one of the things that are, is being debated among these Seti people is, should we send a message or not? And Stephen Hawking has famously said, we should keep our head down. Mm -hmm. Which means, you know, hey, we should sure, not sure. send out messages, shut down all the transmissions that are going into the outer space. We shouldn't be doing that because the idea of, hey, then we're letting them know we're here and then they'll come and take over or something. You don't share that fear. No, I don't share that fear. I think the danger is, uh, is very, very low or inexistent. I also would like to hope that, you know, in, on the Earth, that has been uh, incredible incredible massacres when white people discovered America, when white people invaded Africa. And I hope that, uh, I mean, the way men conducted at the time is, is unexcusable and it was probably dictated by ignorance and 
I don't know what happened, but I, I would like to hope that this, this happened today. We would first of all preserve the civilization we discover rather than conquer them and submit them and kill them. And uh, I think we would now have that attitude. Unfortunately, there are no more civilization to discover. So what I'm hoping is that the civilization advanced enough to come to the earth and discover the earth and life on earth will have this attitude of uh, scientific interest and knowledge and curiosity. So they will come here to study us and preserving us rather than coming here to conquer us. So anthropologists us. and not missionaries or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> How about weird ideas about aliens? Have you had any weird ideas about what aliens could be? I, uh, I think they will be very different from us. Uh, probably, I mean, we, we tend to have uh, an anthropologic view of what uh, an evolved uh, living being can be, but uh, probably life can find very diverse way to develop and, uh, and so on. This is not you know, an alien, it's not necessarily somebody with two legs and uh, two hands. So it, can be, it can be a very different form, probably. How about a micro-alien? Have you uh, talked to microscopists who are looking for microscopic aliens? Uh, no, I never did. Um, what do you think of that idea? Uh, that is probably a, a connection between the size of the living being and the capability to manipulate things. Right? So I don't know if microorganism can ever become a technological a civilization, but maybe, maybe they can play on the nanotechnology scale, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I really so don't know. Will, the will the aliens be <clears throat> Democrats or Republicans? <laughs> that's my personal political, <laughs> no, that's not, uh, I have my sympathies, so, but <laughs> decline. <laughs> okay, <laughs> will they be male or female? Well, if they want to reproduce, they better be both. <laughs> oh, is that right? So, so, all right. Now, what are the most common, in your view, what are the most common misconceptions that people have about this question, are we alone? Misconception. Um, I don't know, probably the man in the street thinks we are not alone because I think um, also through you know, science fiction and so on. Uh, and people know there are many stars, many galaxies. So I think a few people are really confident that uh, we are alone. But uh, Say that again. few people are confident or believe that we are alone. I think if you ask in the street, most people will tell you, no, no, certainly there must be other worlds out there. Then. Uh, uh, of course, they may not realize how frequent or infrequent uh, life may be, and we actually don't know, so anybody answer is as good as anybody else. Um, yeah, but I think people are uh, ready to, to learn about the existence of life elsewhere. Well, for example, I asked a guy, a musician in the street, are we alone? He says, no way, and I said, yeah, what, exactly. what's your evidence for that? And he said, the pyramids. <laughs> well, uh, well, I don't think that's an evidence for, uh, for any extraterrestrial life, but yeah, that's, uh, that's the typical kind of answer. People believe that, yeah, no way, we are alone. It seems strange that we are alone. Come on, how can that be possible? But then, uh, yeah, without the evidence, it's probably all misconception. Right? We have no evidence for one way, one, solution, one answer or the other. We have no evidence. Okay. Are we, are we making progress? We are making tremendous progress in uh, discovering extrasolar planets more and more and uh, in uh, understanding how planets form better and better and probably also in biology, although I'm not so educated in biology too, but I think I've been to a conference on origin in Montpellier and there are I mean, biologists are making enormous progress uh, towards creating artificial life. Artificial life means building living cells, starting from chemistry in the lab. Building a human, a human, sorry, a living being, a cell, uh, just putting all the chemical ingredients together until they start to, the molecules start to cooperate to form a living being. That's amazingly difficult. But there is a, a big process.
progress in doing this. Do you have a definition of life that you can tell us about? That you, you, You've used the word life about a hundred times in this interview. What do you mean by life? Well, I think life is, uh, I stick to the usual definition. So life uh, is something that is capable to reproduce itself, so replicate with errors, so in order to allow some evolution. And uh, there is also, you know, the, the life is related to a metabolism. So the metabolism is uh, the organization of uh, um, molecules in order to, do, to, to, to sustain the, 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 the cell. So I think biolo biologists know pretty well what life is and um, there is uh, no, no real debate. Well, there is, there is a debate if viruses are living beings or not, because mm -hmm. viruses are not able to live alone. They need to squat somebody else in order to replicate, so they cannot replicate alone. And uh, so there is this debate of whether uh, viruses are life or not. It's probably the boundary between uh, chemistry and life. But other than that, I mean, the biologists have no doubt when they see something to say this is a living being or no, this is just a complex mole molecule. So I think that is uh, fairly well uh, assessed. Okay, and uh, to end up, I'll ask you again, are we alone? <laughs> I didn't know before, I don't know now. <laughs> so we give you the same answer. I think we are not alone, but I think life is rare, in particular uh, evolved life is rare. And so that means life is distant. 